Um, and let's not forget that this can't happen without the support of some very kind people and companies. I'll mention Milton Keynes Council first. Uh, we officially have their support. Uh, that's what the MK stands for, for those who are a little bit further away from the middle of England. And uh, they've backed us, including financially, to make more of these things possible in the future. And I think Milton Keynes is a really exciting place to live and work. Um, and I think we are definitely on the way to becoming a really cool, smart city. Um, not only that, uh, I'll give Linda another wave. I've already mentioned Linda a couple of times from Data Reply. Data Reply helped make this possible as well. Amazing uh, AI and data company based in Victoria and London. Linda, could you do me the honor of saying a few words about your amazing company? Sure. So first of all, as always, thank you, Richard, for that, for hosting the event. And um, Data Reply is a consulting company and we work in the ML and AI field. We either do data, data engineering and we design and implement a big data platform, but we also have a lot of data scientists that are keen on building ML, ML and AI algorithms across different industries. Yes, we are in London and I will put in the chat my contact details if you have any question or you would like to have a discussion i'm super happy and open to have a discussion with you guys that's the reason why i'm here and feel free to to reach out thank you again and enjoy the event thank you linda i really can't speak high enough of data reply uk really really good group of people real strong lean on ethics as well and understanding the holistic side of projects Great company to work for too, so do give them a shout. Uh, welcome some new faces. Uh, Thrushan's here, Jaisal's here, Michael's here, Vesna's here. I'm going to say Naomi, but I'm 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 in danger of the him, her, she, her thing. But anyway, that's uh, what I see. So uh, you know, welcome, welcome, Chris, welcome as well, um, Ryan. I always chuckle that you presented in Milton Keynes for us, and you said you were going to beatbox. <laughs> and and I thought you were being serious, and I uh, <laughs> and we never got it, did we? But no, we didn't. Not to we be, didn't. is it? Uh, so, I'm still I'm still practicing. It's one of my uh, lockdown skills that I need to learn. So, so instead uh, of beatboxing, can you tell us uh, a few things about the amazing company that is Amy? Sure, sure. No, I mean uh, it's it's great to be back, Richard. You know, I, I, I you know I love these sessions and. Uh, Always excited to be part of this because whenever I come, I see some familiar faces um, and also a lot of new faces, which is a, a kind of testament uh, to how this community is growing. So, so well done to you, especially. Um, uh, if I were to, I mean, you know, I've got a couple of minutes to introduce Amy or reintroduce Amy for those of you who haven't heard of us. And uh, I thought I'd just talk about what we're working on at the moment. So uh, we are a data and AI company, information management, uh, and we're based out of Milton Keynes. So very local, which is why we love to sponsor MKAI. Um, we provide software and professional services. And, and we do this for like uh, organizations who are like uh, at any stage in their data and AI journey. Right now we're trying something uh, you know, quite unique. Uh, we're focusing on helping businesses within the MK region get started with AI. So uh, that's, that's something that we're focusing on. And how we're doing that is uh, using a service offering that we've come up with known as data sprints. So um, a data sprint is a combination of a design sprint. It's a very short sort of focused exercise and a data hack. And we've taken those two concepts and merged them together. And uh, what it lets you do is very quickly define a problem, acquire data, build prototypes, and, and get you up and running with uh, mm -hmm. AI. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, if you Google Amy Data Sprints, you'll find a link to it, or I'll drop my LinkedIn as well. So, uh, you know, uh, thanks again for having us, Richard, and uh, I hope all of you enjoy today's session. Thank you so much, Ryan. Somebody started singing there, but uh, by the time I found them on the <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was my cue to stay quiet. <laughs> No, I was quite enjoying it, but it was, no, it was me actually. I was I was trying to test my microphone, but it was on mute, so I just thought without moving my lips, I could just. But well, now you it's order. wonderful singing. If only we could have some drums in the background, Ryan. If only there was a way, but never mind. 
<laughs> Rudy, welcome, welcome. I was just looking actually to see uh, where you were on my screen. So I'm going to change around my setup in a minute so that you can present. Are you using slides today, Rudy, or just talking? Slides, yep, let slides. me yep. open that up on the security as well. Um, so let's jump in and let's make the most of the time that we have today. Uh, let me tell you about this fantastic person that I've invited to come and speak to us, which is Rudy van Belkom. So he's a futures researcher at the Netherlands Study Center for Technology, Tr Technology Trends. Excuse me. He recently published his book about ethics in the design process. AI no longer has a plug, which is definitely up there with very cool titles for books. Uh, I will be publishing that in the uh, copy in the chat in just a moment. This offers developers, policymakers, philosophers, and basically anyone with an interest in AI tools for integrating ethics into the AI design process. In addition, Rudy has developed an ethical design game for AI inspired by the Scrum process. This can be used to better streamline the discussion around ethics. The essence of the game is based on the position paper he wrote together with the HU Research Group was accepted for ECAI 2020, an agile framework for trustworthy AI. He's investigated the role of AI in the future of his own field and his scientific article, The Impact of Artificial Intelligence on the Activities of a Futurist, appeared in the World Review's Future. So anybody who knows this group would, by this point, very much understand why I've invited Rudy to come and spend some time with us. Um, it's wonderful to see you. We've got about just over 20 minutes for you to share uh, your thinking with us. So please join me welcoming Rudy. And, Thank you. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, let me uh, first of all start and share my screen. That's always an exciting <laughs> moment. <laughs> Let's see. I could put it on full screen. Is this, can everyone see this screen right now? Looks good. Yes. That is great. It is great. Well, then my 20 minutes start the clock. <laughs> and if you're, uh, if I'm over time, just let me know. Um, Thank you for the introduction, Richard. Um, like, yeah, you, you, you said a lot about me already, so I don't need a real introduction anymore. Um, AI no longer has a plug. You can find it online, it's for free. So the PDF is uh, available um, for you to read. And today I would like to give a, well, somewhat of a summary about the content. So if you're looking for more uh, information about this, then um, you can find the PDF online. Um, well, today I want to talk to you about ethics by design, uh, especially in relation to AI, obviously. Um, and you could say, well, or you could question why ethics in AI is so important or is such a big topic at the moment, because, well, ethics isn't quite new, right? I mean, ethics has been around for ages, for centuries, actually, and philosophers have been talking about different ethical topics for a long time long time and also technology isn't the first time we're talking about ethical uh, topics within for example medical biology cloning etc so ethical discussions are around for quite a while but still when you look at the discussions surrounding ai it seems like everything is kind of new and we're just exploring new ground um so i think it's mostly because when we talk about AI, we're not just talking about the technology. We're not just talking about machine learning, deep learning, algorithms, etc. AI is, like this quote is saying from the AI Now Institute, it's about power. So there's a lot of money involved. The, the stakes are high. A lot of companies are investing big time in this technology. So whoever gets the lead in AI has a big market, obviously. But it's also about politics. It's about geopolitics. Uh, I thought it was Putin who said in 2017, whoever will lead AI will be the world leader. So depending on your perception, if it's true or not, still, when people talk about a new technology like this, it's a big impact, right? We're talking about Europe as more or less an ethical center between the United States and China. What is the role of Europe? Uh, are we getting behind or not? Well, etc. And obviously, it's also about culture. So it impacts the way we behave, not only the way we communicate, but it also impacts the values we have, the norms we have, and it's actually changing how we look at things around us. And 
AI is happening now. So normally ethics is about philosophy. It's, it's about philosophy and practice, but more and more with AI, it's getting, getting into practice as we speak, because for example, we are using Corona tracking apps that are influencing our privacy as we speak. Uh, people are getting killed by accidents with self-driving cars as we speak. And more and more examples are starting to show up that we're not just, it's not just philosophy, like what if, but it's, it's happening right now. Um, so also minorities are being disadvantaged by fraud detection systems. We had a case in the Netherlands where a fraud detection system uh, and, and it was ruled by, by, by law that it was hurting our privacy and maybe more important, uh, setting back minorities and disadvantaging them and creating uh, what you could call a negative feedback loop. So people with less resources are targeted. And you could say, well, luckily there are a lot of ethical guidelines at the moment and in theory, there are a lot, lots of them. But when you take a look at this world map, you could see that the deliberation or the distribution uh, of these different guidelines is not spread equally. So you could see in the map that most of the ethical guidelines that are being published at the moment are uh, centralized in Europe, America, and Japan. So you could say that most, in the most cases, it are the more richer countries that dominate the debate about ethics in AI. And it, as it turns out, it's more or less of a perspective that matters, of course. And it's mostly a European perspective at the moment because, well, the, the highest density in ethical guidelines is in Great Britain. So you, as you can see, it's ETH in Zurich, they researched or analyzed 84 different guidelines. And of the 84 guidelines they researched or they analyzed, 13 of them came from uh, Great Britain. So there's quite a lot talk about ethics, um, but at the same time, and I'm, I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing, it's a good first step. I mean, in Europe, we have the ethical guideline for trustworthy AI presented by the high level expert group from the European Commission, which is a really important first step. But today I'm trying to talk about how it impacts practice and how we can translate these different guidelines into practice. Because when you take a more zoomed in look at those different guidelines, you can say there's a convergence surrounding different topics. So for example, transparency and fairness and, and privacy, those different principles or, or values are being used in most of the documents they analyze. And like I said, it's a good thing, but at the same time, it's some, it's, it's a, what they call it a feel good principle. So uh, everyone obviously is in favor of a transparent system and we all want to be treated fairly and we all want our privacy to be, to be safeguarded. But when we take a look at how we can translate them into practice, there are some challenges. So first of all, we have trade-offs. So you have value conflicts. So there are technical trade-offs. So for example, if we want accurate systems and we want explainable systems, there are, being, uh, there are some conflicts over there because the more accurate the system gets, the less explainable it gets, especially when we look at deep learning and uh, algorithms and neural networks. The more complex they get, the more accurate they get. But at the same time, the explainability is difficult. But uh, besides technical trade-offs, there are also social trade-offs. So what we think is important depends on the context. So for example, uh, when we talk about privacy, it's not a generic thing. It depends on the context and the domain in which we are implying it. So simple example maybe, um, but when I go to the doctor and uh, for an appointment and he, he or she asks me to undress, that is fair enough, right? I mean, it's a doctor's appointment. But if the baker asks me to do the same thing, it's kind of invasive of my privacy. Um, so as you can see with a simple example, like the doctor versus the baker, um, you see that privacy is a completely different thing in a different context. And those different principles and guidelines that are being written at the moment don't really take the different contexts into account. Um, but it's also about measurability. So for example, if we take a look at fairness, it's a, in a lot of 
uh, documents fairness is being uh, used and it's very important of course um, but what is fairness exactly i mean we're talking about fairness for hundreds of years but i don't think we really know how a society without unfairness is looking like so if you translate it to equality or justice how does a equal society look like it's pretty difficult actually to, to think about a 100% equal society and with AI we have another challenge because we have to think about abstract things like fairness in a more mathematical way so it's all about statistics in the end so even though we can agree maybe on what we think is fair and is not fair we also have to think about how can we make that quantifiable so you could say 80% transparency. What is 80% transparent? I mean, it's, it's a bit too easy to put it like that, but we have to make it, take numbers into account when we talk about these different general principles. And when we look at, for example, the high level expert group, they have seven key requirements, which are all important, um, but not just evenly quantifiable. So for example, when we take a look at uh, accuracy or something you can quantify that but social well-being it's kind of difficult and i quote it's about the interrelationship of the seven requirements all are of equal importance so it's suggesting that every application every machine learning application should honor all the values and principles at the same time in every context and i think in practice that is pretty difficult so like i said there are different trade-offs and if you don't think about them in terms of trade-offs, it's pretty difficult to make, make it happen and to make sure that all those different requirements are in the system. And even if we can make that happen, even if we can make it quantifiable and we can translate it into the context, the question still arises, how can we integrate them into the system? Because we have ethical guidelines on, the, on one side, but on the other side, we have, the, we have practical uh, uh, challenges. So you could wonder if those different guidelines, the different ethical guidelines actually change the way companies are operating. So some people are saying that ethical guidelines, however important they are, uh, are more or less a substitute for regulation. So a lot of companies set up advisory boards and ethical guidelines, etc., and try to avoid regulation in a way, because in the end, those advisory boards don't have real power, not, not like regulations or legislations have. So the question is, are these ethical boards and regulations actually changing the way we operate, yes or no? And more and more researchers, especially within the value sensitive design area, are talking about, no, ethics has to be part of the design of technology. So we can't just formulate ethical guidelines and say, okay, <laughs> Here are a set of guidelines. I just hand it over to the programmer, to the developer, and they just, you know, <laughs> I take my hands off. But the problem is there's too much room for interpretation. So we have to think about how can we teach ethical systems or how can we teach AI systems to actually act ethically responsible. And then, and that's why I want to talk about three different system approaches. So when we look at ethical design or ethics by design, um, the question is, how can we integrate abstract values into the system? And there are different system approaches. And in the ethical discussions, well, at least that's my opinion, in most of the times, those different system approaches aren't taken into account enough. So the first approach is called static learning, not statistic, but static learning. And it is um, the approach of this uh, uh, static approach is, can we program rules into the system? So for example, when you look at a self-driving car, you could say, okay, we can calculate every, every situation and all the rules, all the traffic rules, every situation, we can just program it into the system. Um, the positive side of this approach is we can, before we implement it into the system, we can discuss about it. We can elaborate about it. We can make it a democratic decision, what is and isn't important, and we can make all the rules before we are going to use it. So human control in this approach, well, it's, it's doable because we decide what is important 
and we implement it in the system. But the downside is, as I mentioned before, you also have to take the exceptions into account. So if you want to program it into the system upfront, you also have to think about all the acceptance, except, exceptions sorry, that can happen in practice. And I think that there are too many. So if you want, uh, in, in, in this slide, you can see an example. You can tell a security robot not to hurt people, but that will limit yeah, that will be a limit limitation when that robot has to prevent a terroristic attack. And it, the same goes with self-driving car. If we want to avoid a collision and run a red light, we will run the red light because otherwise, yeah, it's... So the second approach is more of an adaptive method, methodology. So instead of programming rules in advance, this approach, this approach suggests to learn in practice. So a system could actually learn in practice from its surroundings. So it's given what they call a goal function. So using this goal function, you can specify what is and isn't important and the system can learn in practice from its surrounding what is and is not uh, ethically acceptable. Um, and Stuart Russell is a, is a, is a big, uh, over, or is a well-known scientist, which think this approach is, is very promising. Um, the downside, however, is, is how can it learn in practice what is right and wrong? Because, for example, if someone steals a bread, I don't know, because they have to feed their family, what does it tell? Is, does it, is, is it learning that stealing is bad and we cannot allow it? Or do we say, well, in some cases it is allowed? It's pretty difficult to make a system without truly common sense make it understandable what to do. Um, so I think also this approach has some downsides. And, prom and, and personally, I believe in the, the third system approach and it's more or less called intuitive learning. So it is combining static learning and adaptive learning. So you get the rules and the, uh, and the, the, the programmed aspect of the static learning and you get the adaptive um, possibilities of that approach. So in the end, you combine rules and ad adaptation and make, make a more or less intuitive system. It's also given a goal function, but instead of learning in practice, the system or people <laughs> um, give uh, some kind of weight factors on these different goals. So for example, if you drive a car, there are different um, goals we have to we have to obtain right so as a as a driver i want to be safe and i want to be efficient because i have to get from a to b but as a society we also want safety on the road and we want it to be good for environment etc so with this intuitive approach we can decide up front what different goals there are and how they weigh in relation to each other so like i said before there are different trade-offs so with this approach we can think of different trade-offs that can happen in practice and we can weigh them in relation to each other. So for example, if we think transparency is really important, but privacy is as well, how can we integrate those two values and maximize them in relation to each other? And I personally believe that we have to think about intuitive approaches because in the end, if we want AI systems to operate in subjective, subjective domains, so not only objective data, which yeah, where right and wrong is crystal clear, but when it's more or less subjective, what we think is important and is good or bad is more subjective, then the system itself has, has also, does also have to make different um, intuitive um, choices. So Richard told about an ethical design game I created, which was based on or inspired by the Scrum process. Within the Scrum process, they, they use so-called user stories. And the positive side of user stories is that it integrates different things that are lacking in ethical debates right now. So like I said, most of the times ethical discussions lack of uh, the different context, um, different stakeholder perspectives, and we have to weigh the, the different values in relation to each other. And as it happens, a user story has all of these different aspects already in itself. So you can choose a different or a specific domain 
and think about different stakeholders and how they have different interests given the context. Um, so as you can see, a user story is defined as the, 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 the stakeholder. I want certain values in order to, what are the interests given the context. And the game I created, this is a, a visual of it. It's only in Dutch at the moment, uh, but we are working on an English uh, um, on an English version, but already on ethicsinc.nl, you can find some more information. You can also find the paper we wrote about um, a more agile approach towards ethical uh, development. Um, so the, that PDF is also available for free over there. And like Richard said in the introduction, the game is used in order to make it more clear that there are different stakeholders involved who have different interests in different uh, contexts. So for example, when we take a look at self-driving car, as a user or as a driver, I have a different specific need when it comes to privacy than when you ask the manufacturer of the car or when you ask the programmer of a car or when you ask it to a legislator. We all have different interests. So when you look at the high level expert group guidelines, you can also see that transparency is not just uh, one abstract uh, uh, definition. There are sub values within. So the same goes with privacy, etc. And this game helps people to not only um, look at the different ethical questions from different perspectives, but also weigh the different values in relation to each other. So it's not a holy grail or something, and it's not the answer to our ethical uh, the questions and problems that we have, but it can certainly help people to learn from different perspectives and to really think from different perspectives, from different stakeholder perspectives. So in the end, it's really important to talk about ethics and we need to keep talking about what we think is important. But my suggestion would be that we not only talk about what we think is important, but also how we think different values relate to each other. So we have to really give weight factors towards those different values and actually translate them into quantifiable, measurable goals. And those measurable and quantifiable goals have to be given to the system so it can actually uh, think or intuitively come up with the best reaction that we need. So if we just use AI and machine learning in, for example, uh, uh, image recognition or, or more or less simpler uh, domains, then it's probably not necessary. But if you are, are perceiving a more human, human and emotional uh, um, artifact, it, in my opinion, strongly, I strongly believe that it needs some ethical uh, uh, and intuitive ethical um, system approach. So if you want to know more about the subject, please take a look at AI no longer has a plug. It has a uh, more in-depth um, um, about what I'm, I, I was talking about today. I mean, it's, uh, it's evening over here, so it was a long day. So I think it's in written, it's way better than, uh, than what I can do today in, in, in 15 minutes. But um, thank you for your attention. Uh, please take a look and uh, let me know what you think about it. You can always uh, send me an email uh, at fanbelcom at stt.nl, but you can also just find me on LinkedIn, uh, Rudy Van Belcom, and then we can just connect and talk about uh, the topic. Yeah. So thank sorry, you, and um, hopefully you have a nice evening with the other uh, speakers as well. Thank you, thank you, Rudy. Uh, it, it's great listening to you. And definitely we know that how important ethical and responsible AI has indeed become today. And uh, we, it's, it's the right time to put in now. And I think uh, right from the design phase, if we have the ethics put in, and especially hearing how you have put it into the scrum board and uh, you know user stories is something really innovative to hear. Uh, and uh, I think for the safety and fairness, because so much data collection takes place, by various systems, it is so important that we put in the ethics at the right time, at the right, right phase when we develop the new systems for the future of AI. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rudy, so much. You're Richard, welcome. Over to you. 
Yes, thank you so much, Rudy and Jezza. Thank you for summarizing, uh, Rudy. If you uh, feel like a, a, a a visual coffee, then just read some of the chat here and see how much conversation you've been stimulating and, and some of the thanks as well that we've been sharing for that. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Um, Thank you. And uh, Rudy, I put a link into your book as well. It's uh, fantastic to be able to share that and amazing that you've made it available for free. Um, are you able to hang around tonight and do some Q&A with us at the end or do you need to shoot off? No, unfortunately, I, I, I can't stay until the panel discussion in the end but I, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if there are uh, if there are questions right now if that's also possible in your schedule yeah well it is actually because I'll, I'll announce in a second that unfortunately sally eves has got something very personal that she's dealing with uh, right now so she's had to postpone so we will get sally eves back in the new year um which does give us a little bit more flex on time uh, would anybody like to put their microphone on ask a quick question of rudy while we have him on the session All right I've got a question. So oh, go ahead, Lucy. Hi, that. sorry. Um, in terms of AI, I know that you said that there's um, there's some wiggle room to look at the static approach and the adaptive approach as well and combine the two of them. Is it possible that I'm not hearing anything? Or, or um, is it just me? I, I, I can hear you. Seems fine, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to give us a wave where you can hear, Rudy? My earplugs are... Uh, <laughs> my battery is down. Uh, oh. you got it. You got us now? Now I can hear, but I missed the question, sorry. Oh, no worries. So in terms of the, the approach that you were recommending, it was a, a combination of the static approach and the adaptive approach and making it so it was more intuitive. Does that require sort of some area of subjectivity? So a human on the end of the AI programming so that when some of these really subjective um, events happen, so say a terrorist attack, you have a human who is on the other end of that, that bot or, or that AI platform, who can actually help inject some, some subjectivity into a situation or into the programming itself? Well, I think um, my recommendation would be that, that a human in the loop or human on the loop, it depends on, on your perspective, is really important. Um, but I think when we are using an intuitive approach, it is already taken care of because we program different rules and principles into the system. And as humans, we give weight to the different goals that we are giving the system. So the fingers crossed, I'm, I have to admit, is that the system itself is, as humans are, uh, capable of making a, a subjective uh, decision or an intuitive decision. So if this, if this approach is working well, then the human in the loop is, is, is necessary, but mostly... Uh, in the phase of programming rules and etc. in the system and combining the different goals and the, the weight we get on these different goals. So, for example, when we drive a car as humans, um, we are able to drive using strict rules, traffic rules, because the last stop, the last step we make is in the context and is in real time. So it's pretty hard to think about those different situations in advance. So we have to make sure that the system itself has the different goal functions and different weights to make that decision on the spot. So that would be the, the most desirable uh, outcome. Uh, and that's a personal belief. Obviously you can disagree, but that, that's, that's okay. <laughs> thank, you. Well, take, thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Should we take two quick questions? Paul's got his hand up, but there was somebody else I think who went to speak, is that right? Yeah, I um, let Paul ask. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, uh, I mean, really enjoyed that talk. And just to kind of um, wonder what your thoughts are about dis a distinction between ethical AI and moral AI. Because when we teach ethics in the universities that I um, am part of, we're very, very clear that ethics are not necessarily good. And actually, uh, if you went and met the devil, the devil's got a code of ethics. Um, right. And we might not agree with them, but ethics can exist along the spectrum. Moral AI is about notions of good and evil, good and bad, acceptable and unacceptable. And so if we put work into, as, as humans, our moral vision for what we want AI to become, that what flows from that is a code of ethics. But people have, I, I'm noticing people are spending less time 
in conversations around morality, they're diving straight into ethical, assuming we understand what that means, and then creating measures and metrics around ethical as if ethical means good. But because we're on a relative spectrum there, that's where the confusion can kick in. Well, I, I can't agree more. Uh, that's true. And it, it sounds like semantics, like ethical or moral, but in, indeed, it's a big difference. So when I'm talking about intuitive systems, I'm talking about moral intuitive systems. So it's more important that the system it says itself has a moral intuition. And when we reflect on it, OK, then we call it ethics. But in, the, in practice, we need to talk about morality. So I, I totally agree. Yeah. Wonderful. Alison, did you want to say something at this point? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, just um, to that question just now, you have to factor in that, that most AI research, um, pure research obviously isn't interested in the commercialization, but the actual AI that we have is developed commercially and for commercial value. So, um, you know, it's really Im imperative uh, what we're really saying that, um, that we start to, to bring more morality into it. Um, before these systems are actually put into play. However, and I made the point in chat, the great thing is that if you don't have an ethical or even a moral AI product, it's not going to sell. So you're ba basically back to you know square one, even if you um, put millions of um, dollars or, or pounds or euros of investment into it. So, so people are now naturally doing it purely driven by economics, by profit, which is, you know, quite ironic in itself. Um, if, if it's not good, if it's not morally correct and ethically correct, it won't go anywhere. It, it'll just die, you know, in the, in the huge pool of, of small, tiny value-add AI-based systems that we currently have today. And that's nothing compared to what's, you know, to come in the future. Um, the, the actual original question I was going to ask, though, was um, uh, to do with the, the point raised in chat about um, how do you have global um, ethics or global morals in an AI system? And unfortunately, that's a political problem. Um, if you look at um, OECD, for example, the, the map is, um, is pitiful of the people that are actually included in that um, you know, international group because it doesn't include any of Africa. And if you take Africa um, as one example of who isn't yet included, that's simply because there are so many countries within that and that you know, some are still fighting with each other. And so it's really difficult to, to get compliance, you know, to, to get agreement um, on, on something as grand as this when you know, they're still um, struggling with, with basic human rights over there. True, and, and the question is exactly? I think no, I was, I was just ba basically <laughs> making the making the point. The question is is actually in chat. Um, I, I would uh, copy and paste it, Rudy. There's a ton of questions in there for, for later if you have to run off. Well, I think I, I think you're right, and it, 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 there are a lot of uh, like I showed the map. I mean, the distribution of, of ethical guidelines is is really unfair, and, and 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 as I pointed out earlier, it's 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 more or less like a richer perspective. And, and in most of the times, a more Western perspective. So um, in an utopian world, uh, let, let's talk about that, is as humans, we can, well, it's not always easy, but we can, um, um, or our, our behavior is dependent on the context. So when I'm in China, I know I'm in China and there are other cultural uh, uh, or, or, or values are interpreted differently. So I can adapt my behavior based on the surroundings. So ideally, a system could do the same thing. Um, I know we, we're pretty far from that as we speak. Um, uh, luckily, uh, I can call myself a futures researcher. So I can maybe, it's not, not always fairly, but I can skip some, some, some things we have in the present and think about how can we move forward in the future. Um, and I do believe that your point about uh, the commercialization of those different systems and obviously if there's no money in it, how can we create them? So that will remain a problem. But in the future, we can also think about different business models. I mean, there is a predominant business model at the moment, but it's not the only one possible. Um, and then we can also think about regulation. So when 
more democratic values are, are, are a, a, the center of our regulations, but maybe even of our business models, I still have some hope that in the end we will get there. I mean, at the moment, when you take a look at algorithms used by platforms like Facebook, etc., I mean, they are designed to keep our attention. So we're, we are stuck in this attention economy and probably if you've seen the, the social dilemma, it, 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 it really shows us well that we're stuck in this attention economy. So if I like cat movies, for example, the algorithm knows, okay, I just show him cat movies because I want his attention. But if we can design um, uh, polarization because using this kind of algorithms, you can only, you only see and get confirmed by what you already believe, then I truly believe that we can also design diversity. So maybe it's a bit utopian, but I, I strongly believe that it's a, everything is a design uh, matter. So if we can design a bad system, we can also design a good system. And yes, we have some big problems ahead and, 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 and difficulties, but that shouldn't be a reason not to start. Uh, uh, so yes, there are, are a lot of things we are missing at the moment and business models and, and geopolitics and everything is, is, is blocking that at the moment. That is true. I, I'm not disagreeing on that part, but I think we need to move forward and think about how we can actually change also the essence and the fundamentals of those different, for example, business models, etc. So I may, don't really answer your question, but it's, it's in a way a hopeful... Uh, uh, may I ask a question? Sorry, I don't know how to raise a hand. It's okay. It, we need to be fairly quick if we can make it a fast one, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm interested in the interface. So you're basically thinking of... Uh, uh, of systems that have uh, that are rule based and also machine learning based, basically, right? Yeah. So uh, basically, they have to speak in some way. There must be some concept at the interface that they speak with. So this concept is certainly based on some edit code. Right. Where are you going to get those from? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, the, the 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 shortest answer would be uh, is a suggestion uh, to, to, to uh, for a Google search. Um, the domain that is working on combining the, this, the, this representative systems and, 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 and machine learning or deep learning system is called deep reasoning. Um, and if you Google deep reasoning, you, you are probably going to find some papers about the subject. And they are trying to bridge the gap between the, do the two different approaches that are pretty dominant but are uh, 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 not really included at the moment. But deep reasoning is like the reasoning and the deep learning uh, combined in a way. So I have some hopes uh, regarding that uh, approach. Yes. Wonderful. We, we must move on. Thank, uh, Pasquale, you. thank you for that question. Uh, and let's move on to our second speaker. Rudy, thank you so much. Once again, I really appreciate you joining us today. You're welcome. And thanks for the interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our second speaker is Dango. Uh, Dr. Danko Nikolic, who is a brain and mind scientist, an AI practitioner and visionary. He led a lab at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research and tells me that his foremost interests are closing the mind-body explanatory gap and using that knowledge to improve machine learning and AI. His work on brain research at the Max Planck Institute led him to develop the theory of hierarchical hierarchical adaptations. He can say that better than me. <laughs> From there, he proposed the concept of AI kindergarten, a method for the creation of biological-like AI. And he also introduced the concept of, uh, I just see it, I can't say your words, Danko. Uh, <laughs> help me say this word, idiocesia, idiocesia. He's on mute. Idiocesia. Thank you. And most recently is active in applied ML and AI. I read that many times as well to practice, would you believe? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's put about 20 minutes on the clock. Uh, welcome to MKI. We look forward to hearing from you. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to scare you with scary words that are hard to understand. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, so, what I will be talking to you about is differences between AI technology. Um, 
We can yeah. we can see you. I can't see any slides. No Are slides. You slides. Are you sharing uh, yes. the wrong screen? Yes, I am. I am sharing uh, slides. Why am I not? Do you see? Do you see? When you when you hit share screen, you should get a choice of however many monitors you have there. Oh yeah, I have choices, but I forgot the second button, which says share. Now it should be That's done, it. right? It's coming now. I see it. Now you see in New York. Yeah. And now you see the brain. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank good. you. So, thank you for for correcting me. Um, so I'm I'm a brain scientist and. AI person in the same time. So I, I am the one who, who is probably, you know, the right person to, to point out that there are differences, that these are not the same things. And very often you would see some companies, for example, advertising our AI works like human brain. That's not true. You don't need to read any further. That's not true. There are su such big differences between how our brain works and how our technology for AI works. It's just huge. And I will explain to you a few today so that you hopefully walk out convinced for the, for the rest of your lives that these are, these are just two considerably different things. Right? But to, to begin with this topic, let us consider this guy. Right? That's, a, that's kind of a prototypical robot that we, we were promised by science fiction to have at home by now. And it would be nice to have one at home to take care of households so we have more time to watch Netflix or whatever. But we don't have one yet, don't we? What we get instead is this guy here. And this guy is good, but it doesn't do lots of things that need to be done because our households have a lot of other things in work to be done, right? So what are these robotic companies doing? Why are they not building uh, humanoid-like robots to take care of our households? And to point this out, let me, let's, let's check one, uh, one robotic company that in particular has developed a robot that can do backflips. Now, why backflips? Why would you need a robot that does backflips? Do you think they, they came up, like the, the marketing research got messed up and they figured out like, oh, the market needs robots with the do backflips. Everybody's going to be buying the robots with backflips. Probably not. But what happens is basically that's all they could do. Well, on the, on the right side, we need robots that can do dishes. What we get at best is robots that do backflips. Now, uh, why is that? So there's something in, in, in uh, AI theory that's called Moravec's paradox. And this paradox tells us that things that are easy for AI are hard for humans and things that are easy for humans are hard for AI. And, uh, and the fundamental reason is that biological brains and machines work differently. So I welcome now to the seven differences. So the difference, number one, is type of errors we make. You, you can see who is machine and who is AI. You don't need to ask them questions about knowledge and how they solve problems. Just look the type of errors they make. And to illustrate that, here's a task for you. Watch this second hand and detect the moment when it skips one second. So my point here is that, it, that we humans are easy to distract. We could do one thing at a time. And uh, when something else comes up, we lose focus from one side and we move to the other side. It, this is called vigilance error. And we humans do vigilance errors. And many of the traffic accidents that happen are, are due to vigilance errors. Like majority are due to vigilance errors. And machines don't do vigilance errors. If we build a machine to monitor one thing, it will forever keep monitoring this one thing. It will not get distracted. So that, that's one difference. What kind of errors do machines do? They do something that we could describe as stupidity errors. And this was illustrated 
also by Charlie Chaplin in his in his now hundred years old movie called Modern Times, where they build, build this machine for feeding factory workers. At the beginning, everything worked fine, and it even could, could the machine could even help you know clean the mouth of of a person. But then. After a while, things got really problematic and didn't work anymore. Well. And, and the, basically, in machines, when something doesn't work right, machines cannot notice that. They don't get their attention distracted, uh, focused towards things that don't work right. And that's what our brains are really good at. Right? So on one side, we get distracted by irrelevant things and maybe some things we shouldn't be distracted with. But then on the other side, we also get attracted our attention to the problems, to the things that don't work. And we, we are able therefore to solve them. Machines can do that. When things are going wrong, they just keep doing it, doing it wrong. Okay. Second difference, very important difference is concepts. So consider a concept of a chair which is necessary in order to recognize, detect the chair. So how would you train a deep learning network? Everybody knows here, I, I think, how to do that. And for that, you need a lot of lots of examples of chairs. Eight examples of chairs is not enough. You need more, like thousand or million. And then you could have a, an AI that can do chairs. And you can say, look, I have an AI that recognizes chair and re distinguishes that from from um, cars or, or whatever, or windows or flowers, animals and so on. But there's, there's still a problem. There's still a big difference between how humans do chairs and how, how machines do chairs. Check this chair. This is a very unusual chair. And if you give typical examples of chairs, then a machine will not be able to recognize this chair. Neither will be, rec be able to recognize this one or that one or this one here, right? And I have even more weird chairs that AI algorithms will have hard times with and we humans can do because we have actually proper concepts, right? Look at this chair, look at that chair and this one, right? And why is that? That's because our concept of a chair is not only just about features that the chair has, it's about what it does to our body, how it helps us relax and sit down like, so the concept is about setting. So this is also a chair. We can also see a chair here and an AI algorithm cannot see a chair here. And we can also see different types of chairs even here, right? And here's even more weird chairs that the machines would have a really hard time distinguishing, right? So you, we have concepts that are much more powerful and we don't use them just to recognize things. We also use them in, in many other very useful things. So check out this kit. Now let's talk about recognizing cars rather than chairs. This kid could see a car for the first time in his life and play for this with this toy for, for half an hour and sit and push around, turn the steering wheel and so on. The kid acquires the concept of a car. Now after that, you draw something like this to a kid. And you ask, what, it, what is it? The kid may not at first no, uh, agree that this is a car, but then you say, look, it's a car, and the kid then would recognize, so, oh, yeah, it looks like a car. Now comes the power of a concept of a car. When you draw this, and if a kid has ever played with a train, it will realize that it will recognize here a train. If this drawing before was a car, this drawing here can be a train, no problem. Only our brains can do such a shift in concepts. The machines cannot even get close to it. And we can do even more. Check this out. I go back to this one and I tell you, look, that's not a car anymore. It was a car, but now I shift your concept. I shift your perception. I change your mind. This is now a table with two chairs. Boom, no problem. I just completely converted your perception with a couple of words. And now if this is a table with, this, with two chairs, what is that? Huh? Do you see a classroom here? Do you see a restaurant here? Sure you do. You see how flexible your concepts are. Machines can do nothing like this. And all that done by seeing just a couple of examples of cars and a couple of examples of tables with chairs, not millions of examples. Right? And it is concepts that make us so intelligent. 
And we have some very important concepts in our lives, like the concept of self that has lots of subcomponents, lots of subconcepts, like our name, our looks, our goals, what we like, don't like, friends, and so on. This is one very important, big, elaborate concept we have. We have also a concept of time is very important. We structure our memories and along the time, understanding of the world's events. It's very much organized along, along the time. Then another important is related to profession, depending on which profession you do. There's lots of rich concept, conceptual structure over there. Right? That's how we get uh, how we get intelligent through concepts. And self-awareness is is a concept of something that we call self. Right? So. Uh, for example, somewhere in the history, for the first time happened that someone said, holy smoke, I'm standing, I'm standing here. That someone has noticed the fact, the relationship between the space, relationship between an organism, that's me, and the, and the, relationship, and the, and the posture of a body standing. And this relationship, three concepts playing around, making one, one, one representation, one dynamic, it's an insight of, about the self-awareness. And that's something that happened for the first time somewhere in the history because what, what, what scientists, brain scientists very often like to, like to point out is that uh, self-awareness is one of, the, one of the key intelligence and consciousness advantages of humans and other animals have much less of that. Right? It's all about concepts at the end. Right? The next difference, context. We humans love context. Machines don't like context. Our machines just don't care much about context. Uh, and to prove that, for the purpose of this talk, I made a test. I took Cortana and asked her, what is the capital of Germany? And Cortana correctly said, Berlin. And then I said, and of France. And what do you think Cortana answered? Did she, did it, she say Paris? which would be a proper understanding of context. No, she didn't. She said, I pulled some images of friends for you. Cortana did not understand a basic concept that come totally naturally to us humans. And of course, Microsoft engineers could build something in a machine to understand in this particular case that I'm still talking about a capital city, but this is not natural to the way how our technology works. For our humans, context is natural. For machines, it's not. And by, when doing that, I noticed something quite interesting about these assistants, and that's about their logos. This is the logo of Siri. This is the logo of Alexa. This is the logo of Cortana. You see a pattern here? Now, the logo of, of Google Assistant, does anyone remember? Here we go, right? You see a pattern here? So where, does it, where do these circuits come from? I asked myself, why circuits? Where do they come from? And then I remember something from, from a, a history of, of science fiction, science fiction of artificial intelligence. And it's this guy here, right? uh, which is a, a computer uh, in, in Odyssey 2000 something. Right? And then we got also this circuit here that we talked about already. Right? So it's all about circuits for some reason. Okay, anyway, for machines, random stuff is perfectly fine. Machines like random. Uh, even if you, uh, deep learning likes random, and if you, even for learning, you probably all know that your samples need to be randomized to get good training in, in deep learning. And that brings us to the fourth difference, which is learning, how we learn. And to, to, to point out this difference, I made a little video here. Collect, uh, I made a collection of random images and I made a video to, that, that makes you experience what is it like to be a deep learning network in, in a learning experience. So uh, this movie here that I will just start in a moment, is basically has a random sequence of random images. I literally Googled random images, put them in a sequence and then mark them. I label them. 
living, not living, living, not living, living, not living. And now I play this movie for you so you, so you can enjoy, you can feel what is it like to be a, a deep learning network. All right. So uh, did you like it? Did you enjoy it? Probably not. That's not something suitable for a human. What we humans need is a story. Story is a context. So one event happened and the next event happened related to the previous event, happened to the pre next event and so on. It has to have a story. It has to have a continuum of events. So to, to, to show you that, I now show you exactly the same images that you have seen now. Exactly the same random sequence, but I add a story to it. Right? So it starts like that, this. Once upon a time lived a dwarf named Pepito. Pepito had a dog, Barfi. One day they hit the road and tossed the coin to decide where to go and decided to reach Antarctica. They didn't trust airplanes, so they traveled through Africa, from Europe, obviously, by train. When they reached South Africa, they waited for a boat. While waiting, they went for a dive where they met Horatius, who took them to Antarctica on his back and success in the end. Right? So it's the same random sequence of images, but if you put them in a story, then now they make sense. Now you remember them. Now if you, you, know, if I, if you meet me two years later and we discuss the story, you will remember the story. You will remember part of the story. The first thing that's good for deep learning network, it was totally confusing for us. And also it's important to know that we don't, the stories do not evolve for us only in time. They also evolve in space. So, so this here is one famous painting from, from a Russian painter called Ilya Repin. And the, naming, the name of the painting is They Did Not Expect Him. And it's, it's a static painting, and yet it tells a story. And to discover the story, the painting, what you need to do, you need to watch it for a little while. You Take, you look at one part of the painting, you detect what is there going on, you get like one message, then you move to the another part of the painting, you look what's happening there, and then you go around and you build your story. And only at the end, you have an understanding of the painting, right? And in neuroscience, we can also have machines to track where people are looking, so we can see how people are thinking and building their understanding of the story. And that's pretty much what you get when, when people are looking at the story. So what happens is that you look at one person and then you look where this person, painted person is looking, then, then you also are interested. Where is this woman looking to? And then you see this, this, this guy here. Then you are interested, where is this guy looking? And you go back and forth, back and forth. And that's how we build this image. So it's again a story, it's again context, just in space. Okay, difference number five, creating new concepts on the fly. It's not that we all only that we have lots of concepts, but we can concept new one, uh, create new ones on the fly quickly. So I'll create for you a crazy concept that you I'm sure didn't have before this. And this is concept of a banana riding on a bicycle. And to, to help to develop this context, I, will, I first can give you a static image where you can, again, spend a little bit of time and looking around and you understand the relationship and you build your concept. But then I'll give you even a stronger story. I'll tell you about a poor village in Africa in which people work hard to, to survive and they have to go long distances to get to get food, to get what they need to, to make sales. And one of the things they do, they go to the, to the local market and sell bananas. And to carry, they have a bicycle as only transportation tool. And the one who is riding on a bicycle in this process is not humans, it's the bananas who need to be taken to the market, right? So now I created for you a concept, a wonderful concept that's probably you'll never need it again. Right? Difference number six. Working memory. Working memory is something amazing we have. And, and to, to, to show it to you what working memory is, I'll, I'll have a little experiment that looks like experiments we actually do in lab in, in, in neuroscience, right? So what you will have now in the task, you will have one image appearing that will disappear in the next image and you have to detect differences, right? So 
Ready? What has changed? The question is what has changed? And most of the people are would successful detective change in this task and that's that red and yellow have changed, exchanged places and those who are really attentive would also notice that the, the nuance of a red color has changed as well. Right? And this is quite easy to, 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 to do well because this task is within the limits of our working memory. Our working memory is somehow limit, limited to about four things. If I put five or six colors, you would have really hard time detecting. Only by chance you, you could get it right. Now that's really amazing. How is that possible? How, how does this make sense that our memory is only four items? We are so intelligent and we have a memory of only four items. Compare that to machines. Machines can memorize every single pixel. We have a machine that can memorize millions of pixels in an instant. We call it a camera. This machine is called a camera, and it, this camera is this machine is looking at me right now and sending these pixels to you. And why why are we so have this wonderful brain with 80 billion neurons and we can remember only four things? What the heck is going on? How is that fair? And how is that possible? And and to explain that, let's get let's get the second experiment, like a very similar one, very similar one, almost the, the same one. Also with four elements. I, I give you four elements, right? Ready? Huh. Was this one in the first group of four or not? And now, if you were not, if you are not a, a Chinese writer, writer of Chinese characters, right? You can't tell. You have no idea. If it, if we are still back to four, but you can't tell. Why? Not because these characters are more complex. It's only because they're more complex for us, for Europeans who are not trained in, in, in Chinese characters. We do not have concept for each individual character. And Chinese people have. And if there's Chinese people in the audience, it was obvious for them that this character was present. And they even noticed very clearly that I turned it upside down, right? It's no problem for them. For us, it's hard. So, the answer to the, to the question of working memory, why do we have this limited working memory and why is it only four, is that because we work with four concepts, we can have four concepts at a time, working together, fighting, collaborating, finding out solution to a problem, uh, negotiating among themselves how to navigate a situation. That's actually the core of our intelligence is these four concepts at every moment in time, working out and solving problems and coming with new creative ideas to solve problems. Some things machines cannot even be close today of doing. And finally, difference number seven, that's the, that's the last one. We, only, we do not have all of these wonderful concepts and, and we are not only working through context and, 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 and all these things. But we have long-term goals and we have multiple ones. And in addition, we have entertainment. Our, our, our AI does, uh, our, uh, not AI, biological intelligence, so BI. So I'll, I'll go through this re really uh, quickly in the interest of time. So we can have really long-term plans like graduating from school, building a home one day or retirement, right? And we have to do all crazy things for, for entertainment, like these people here. There is a sport discipline that you may never heard of. It's called extreme ironic. And these people won one of the competitions on extreme ironic, right? So crazy stuff just for fun. Right? And finally, uh -huh, here's, the, here's the conclusions. So what are the conclusions? The brain and machines work fundamentally different ways. Only we humans and we biological machines use concepts. Animals as well use concepts, just like humans, and context and stories. Machines are not anywhere close to reaching human intelligence because they don't have concepts, context, and stories, and don't do vigilance errors. So for the foreseeable future, humans will have jobs. Machines will not take over. 
And here's my final, here's my final video I want to show you. Uh, I started with the problem of robots not being able to do dishes. And, uh, and we need robots to do dishes. And, I wanna, and the point is that animal brains are, of course, much more similar to human brains and work in a similar way, not like machines. And animals can do dishes. And here's a proof that uh, animals can do dishes. Nothing, it's nothing that robots could do. Look at this dexterity and this capability of manipulating all these objects. Okay, good. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Danko, for your uh, lovely talk. I must say this. So many visuals and, uh, you know, the Charlie Chaplin video was like a nostalgia that uh, brought in, you know, so many memories together. And it is so true that fundamentally our brain works so differently uh, as compared to machines. And thank you for sharing those seven differences and about concepts, context, and stories. And, uh, you know, all those visuals have just, you know, brought so many things uh, right with the right insight to us, you know, that how we are different and we need to understand that machines can never overtake us, you know. Thank you. Thanks so much, Danko. Over yeah, to you, Richard. You. Thank you. Um, we've got to keep just a half an eye on time. Um, well, actually, more than half an eye, but we have got a, a minute or so. Alex has just popped a question up here. Uh, Danko, are you okay if I read it out? Mm -hmm. You may see it in the chat as well. He says, it's interesting, but is this about the hardware, the firmware, the software, the configuration, the data? Do we accept that underlying both humans and machine intelligence is something like a Turing machine? Or do we think that there is no level on which we can build both types of intelligence? Can you take that one? Oh yeah, I could write a book about that one. That's a, that's a deep one. Uh, so it's it's basically fundamental different approach to a problem. Right? On, on one hand, we have like Turing machine kind of logic concepts is is for our for our AI for our machine learning. Uh, human mind works nothing like that. Right. Human brain, actually, I have to correct myself. Human brain doesn't work nothing like that. Right? So, what we what what we can invent is only by observing our thought process. Right? We, so we observe our thinking, and we come up with math. We come up with logic. Logic is something we first invent, and then learn, teach others to 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 do. But that's not how the, how the machine who invented math. The machine who invented logic works, worked at the moment when it invented math, at the moment when it invented logic. What happened behind, we don't know. We simply don't know. And actually, unfortunately, the brain science is not at this level to give, a, give a, an answer. And to say, like, look, in order to, like, with, with author, authority, come and say, like, in order to get machines working like human brains, you know, this, 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 and that. We don't have that. Unfortunately, we don't have that. The, the brain science is not yet there, right? We, all we know is that it's not a Turing machine. It's not like, like math. Like math is not how the brain works. So um, is there anything else in the, in the question? Let's see. Uh, is there, there is no level on which we can build both types of intelligence. Uh, well, we, we could... We could potentially build something that has similar principles to human brain, yeah? And that will be different AI, it will be still a machine that's much, much more similar to how, how human brain works. But at the moment, we don't know how to do that. And um, we'll Danko, still have to figure it out. Can I ask a question? This is Paul here. Um, when we observe our thinking, what is it that's observing our thinking in us? <laughs> it's it's 
it's a concept. It's one concept of observing some other concept <laughs> and it's four of them maximally playing and looking what, what's going on, right? And trying to create a new concept. And it, it's, a game of, it's a game of concepts playing. Isn't that another concept? Yeah, it's another concept. It's all concepts at the end, right? It's all concepts. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, taking that one. Another quick question before we move on. May I ask a question? This is Vikram here. Sure. Uh, thank you, Denko, for the fascinating presentation. I was wondering, what do you think is the role of emotions uh, here? I understand like concepts clearly uh, make a difference, but what about the emotions? Well, emotions that I, I intentionally skip because everybody knows that there's a, one important difference is emotions between between humans and machines. And emotions are very important in human brain, and and one reason why why they are important is that human brain has has lots of things happening in parallel, and they kind of fight each other who is going to win, and at the end how the body as a whole will decide what to do. Am I going to uh, eat the lunch or not? Am I going to go to to watch a movie or go for a walk? You have to make a decision at the end. And now if you have lots of undecided small guys deciding at the end, you have like too much democracy and nothing is decided. So somebody has to like slam a hammer and say like, no guys, we are doing this. And that's what emotions do to you. They, they at the end slam the hammer and you know, when one group is starting winning, then they kind of get the control of emotions and then you get all excited about a movie and like you go for a movie and the other guys who wanted to go for a walk, they have no chance anymore. So emotions are necessary to make a decision in such a, in such a process. Thank you. Okay. Um, so do pop any more questions on the chat if um, Danko, you're able to have a quick read of that. Uh, but Thank you so much again. That was uh, something quite uh, special here at MKAI. And thank you for pleasure. sharing that wonderful presentation with us. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage our final speaker for the evening, which is Alison Landers from NVIDIA. Um, Alison's very, very kindly agreed to come and speak to us tonight. So uh, who is she? Well, she joined NVIDIA in 2015. She spent the first uh, year and a half as a deep learning solutions architect. She's now responsible for NVIDIA's AI developer relations across EMEA and North America. She's a graduate in AI, combining technical and theoretical computer science with a physics background and over 25 years of experience in international project management, entrepreneurial activities, and the internet. She consults on AI applications, planetary defense with NASA and ESA, which is the European Space Agency, and the UN. She works closely with the community of AI and ML researchers around the world, remaining knowledgeable in state-of-the-art across uh, all areas of research. And she advises and teaches on NVIDIA's GPU computing platform around the globe. Uh, so again, no surprise to anybody why we would want uh, Alison to come and speak to us. So Alison, you're very, very welcome. Um, let me see if I can uh, adjust my screen here. Are you there? Alison, you're on mute. Here we go. I just spotlighted okay. you now. Can you see my screen? I can see here the and see your logo. slides. Absolutely. You can. All right. Wonderful. Sorry. Well, once you fire off a PowerPoint, it, it flings screens all over, and I've got multiple screens here. So after a little bit of juggling. Yeah, thanks very much. I really appreciate the, um, the invite, and um, it's been a fantastic discussion up to now. So um, moving swiftly on, and uh, from basically from, from what Danko has just been talking about, I'd, um, I'd like to start by um, asking the question of what it actually means to, to be human um, versus artificial. Um, I mean, there are a lot of positive things, of course, but there's also a lot of negative. Uh, we get tired, we're fallible, we think we're right, all the time, um, we think we're unbiased um, when we're definitely not, um, when we definitely are biased. And, and I could go on, um, but that'll put a downer on things. And one thing that we all know for sure is, you know, think Brexit, think, uh, you know, the, the recent US 
election that's still ongoing. We don't agree. We very rarely agree on things, which is great. You know, competition is is very healthy and debate is um, is very healthy. Um, so we should definitely think of AI, artificial intelligence, as um, a great mediator. Um, not you know not the emotional one, but the logical one. And um, here's the key though, um, and this ties back into um, Rudy's talk um, previously. This is AI plus humans and what we call Hill or human in the loop. You know, this is a software engineering term, Hill or Sill, which is software in the loop. Um, so far as a sight or what we call um, perception in, um, in the AI field, any artificially intelligent system is far vastly superior um, to humans um, with, with any kind of per perception. Um, you know, it was years ago that we actually beat humans in, um, in you know, threshold tests that, um, that have been in, improved year on year um, ever since. Um, for sound or speech or something called NLP, so natural language processing or NLU, natural language um, understanding, as it's now evolved into, um, we're getting there. Uh, definitely, you know, there are so many nuances that, uh, that AI um, is just rubbish at um, simply because of that um, complexity. Uh, taste and smell, there's actually not much, you know, talking about our, our five senses, taste or smell, there's not much research out there. There's a little bit of cancer research because dogs can literally smell um, cancer. For example, looking into um, that, we've been researching the um, um, olfactory um, nerve system of dogs for hundreds of years, actually. Um, but there's not much yet with them um, with AI. Um, but touch or manipulation, so um, actuators and, and manipulation in robotics is a, is a massively researched field. But the real power um, comes when you actually give humans the power of AI, of, of um, artificial intelligence. And that in itself encompasses a massive field with tons and tons of subsets. So um, forgive me when I use the term AI, it's actually a, a huge scientific field with, with many different um, subsets, machine learning, computer science, you know, all, all within that. Um, so because of that power, that's essentially why we invented it. You know, this hasn't come out of thin air. This has been invented and is currently still being invented and will probably continually be invented um, as the human race evolves. You know, this is really in, if you think about, um, you know, getting going as far back as, as the beginning of civilization, you know, the, the human um, era, the anthropomorphic era is just a tiny little instance of, you know, the, the, the earth of the, the earth's lifetime or the universe's lifetime. And AI, artificial intelligence, is absolutely minute when, when it, you come to our technological progress. You know, we're still in it's in infancy, you know, it's, we, we talk about an artificially intelligent agent being, a, you know, on par with about a three-year-old child, you know, at its best. Um, and if you take, for example, um, what we're doing right now, you know, this, this wonderful world of, um, of webcams, um, AI already, you know, and this is, this is our products that we're, that we're already shipping, um, can give us these these fancy backgrounds you know it's AI that basically as I move around like this keeps tracking my head and you know it means that I can block out you know my front room which I'm stood in right now etc um, it can do really amazing things like reduce background noise you know when kids are running through you know and, and your dog's howling in the background that kind of thing um, but also what it's able to do now is it's literally creating um, a three. I'm not sure Zoom has enabled this yet. Um, and I might be wrong, um, but there's a lot actually, you know, being done in development right now. But what we were actually able to do is create a 3D representation of me, of you, and stream that versus massively sort of bandwidth choking um, real time video, um, and you dramatically lower the actual data that you're pushing through your, your, you know, your home broadband, your home internet connection, um, which, you know, lowers latency, improves 
um, the capability, but also at the same time, you can take that representation and turn it into high res, even if you've got a completely rubbish camera attached to, to your laptop or your home setup. You can do a ton of, of little things, um, which is the, what I mean by those little value adds. Um, and as I said, some of those capabilities um, have been implemented. Some are about to be implemented because it's an ongoing, evolving process. None of us knew that we would all be doing this, you know, back in January. Um, you know, it's it's rapid, very, very rapid progress, but um, almost on an instantaneous basis that, that we have to come up with these solutions. Um, however, I work for NVIDIA and the company was built on gaming, you know, since the, since the, the late 90s. Um, and what that means is we've been synthesizing life and creating realistic humans and, and realistic um, environments for, for a very long time. And, you know, there's now over a billion gamers that, that continuously demand extremely high quality, um, you know, rendering Oscar winning movies, for example, um, or robotic um, sims. And our latest GPUs, if you don't know what a graphics processing unit or a GPU is, that's, that's them, the, the gaming cards, the GeForce brands, um, the latest brand at the bottom of that picture there. This is Ampere. So Ampere is the name of the actual silicon, the chip inside that does all of the, of the work. Um, and it's up to the performance again. But that was way back in March when we actually released it. You know, there's been a lot happening since then. And as I said before, AI is a huge field, but um, we take data and with it, we create a mathematical model. And here are some of the ones that are actually in use. If you take speech, as I said, NLP, natural language processing, the progress is literally insane. Just in three years, the parameters alone have grown from 65 million to over 175 billion different parameters. So GPT on that graph um, on the right there, it stands for generative pre-training. And it's a Google technique, a, a Google research that requires a vast amount of, of compute. It would literally take over 15 years to train one of those models on a single ampere GPU. However, if you cluster together um, a ton of, of GPUs, it can, you know, you can do that same job in, in a, a, a mere hours, but it still does take hours because NLP is a massively complex job. Um, and that's good because things like high fidelity sensors, um, such as South Africa's um, square kilometer array or large scale simulations of the COVID-19 genome take terabytes of data. That's a million, million or 10 to the 12 um, a zettabyte. Um, so that's the, the chart on the left there is 10 to the 21 or a thousand trillion trillion. So that's what I mean by insane numbers. Um, so today, this is your typical GPU accelerated data center or a supercomputer. Um, the gold units that you can see there are our DGX um, servers. They have eight GPUs in each and the silver are the traditional CPUs. So this is um, what most people have got today. And um, this kind of setup, as it says there, um, with 50 DGXs, 600 CPUs, will set you back about $11 million. Um, but it also takes about 630 kilowatts to actually run it all every single day. With Ampere, the new chip, this is all you need for the same performance. Um, however, um, you've only got five units, so it only costs you $1 million, and it's only using 28 kilowatts of power, which means much, much lower carbon footprint. And yesterday, um, I think you were talking with, with AWS, Richard, um, about greener AI, and um, you know we, we mentioned this um, when I first joined the actual call. Um, our DGX Superpods, which are a, a slightly different configuration to this, but but on a similar kind of size, um, are now the world's most efficient. And um, this is actually our supercomputer that we call Celine in um, headquarters in uh, California, in Santa Clara. And it's number five in um, the green 500 list. Um, however, no computer on the planet can compute everything. So we use something, um, well, we use lots of different techniques, but one of them is called partial differential equations or PDEs. And they can explain concepts like fluid dynamics um, or how water or air 
behaves, um, for example, um, across space and time. And computing these in Fourier space, so think signals or waves, you know, how we animate hair flying in the wind is all down to Fourier transforms. Um, if we use Fourier space as opposed to just Euclid, typical Euclidean or, you know, height width depth that, that we know of, um, you can do this computation a thousand times faster. And using neural networks, which are the basis of AI, you know, it's what we're trying to make an, an, um, an artificial version of, you know, the, the networks in our own brain. Um, if you use those as well, you can reduce error. And there's a, there's a recent paper out that actually just has proven on these Earth system models for climate, for example, that they've reduced the error by a further 30%. Um, so what you can then do is using a combination of our software here, and these samples are of one kilometer resolution from um, the European uh, Meteorological Center, um, ECMWF, and you can produce a fully interactive simulation. I can only show you a video here, but you can actually go in, you can zoom, and you can really find out, um, and this is you know, accurate physical capability of a weather system in operation. And you can do all kinds of prediction, et cetera. Um, one of the first things that I was actually involved with um, after I joined NVIDIA, which was um, five and a half years ago now, I can't believe that, um, was setting up something called the Frontier Development Lab. Um, so at its core, we basically use AI to solve existential threats to the planet. And here we're looking at a, um, a Ugandan farmer. And this summer, um, one of the teams spent two months developing an AI-based GPU accelerated algorithm that can predict extreme rainfall within five days. So it gives her five days notice, which is time to harvest her crop before devastating floods. And um, they're actually developing a mobile app right now. Um, this fantastic um, picture is, is a rendering, um, and it's again part of the um, one of the summer's um, challenges um, called Moon for Good um, with NASA, where we're basically helping to find water um, and, and therefore suitable landing sites for the landings that are going to start taking place um, on, on back on the moon's surface. Um, this is the Faustini crater near the moon's south pole, which is permanently dark. It's permanently in shadow. It's called a, a you know, PSR, permanently shadowed region. Um, combining physics with something called real-time ray tracing, where we're literally using the GPUs to follow the rays of light themselves and get that you know, really high-res photorealistic capability that gamers demand you know, for realism, um, we're, we're basically able to illuminate these PSRs. Um, and so that helps um, in, the, in the search, but also, as I said, for landing sites. But we're not limited to following just rays of light. You could essentially use this same technique for any um, you know, characteristic within the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so, you know, we, we're just scratching the surface on that, literally. Um, there's a ton of people that were involved in this work again this summer, which predicts lightning, which essentially starts most wildfires. Um, they, the paper will actually feature at um, the world's number one um, AI conference, NeurIPS, um, next month, um, as well as COSPAR, which is the space research um, conference. And what they do is they essentially take the GOES um, sat weather satellite and they take the data from that to provide 15 minute warnings um, with an incredible 50% um, reduction in false alarms. And false alarms are, you know, we, we know just from car, uh, car alarms, they're, uh, they're not a good feature. Um, essentially to, to address climate change, our first priority is to stop deforestation. Um, and what you can do is you can use Earth observation techniques or EO techniques. Um, so that's satellite data of the entire globe. And with that, you can actually rapidly identify areas just with a computer vision solution. Um, and these are areas that have changed radically over a period of days or weeks. Um, so we can literally see all over the globe now. And I'm currently working with the UN and um, the European Space Agency on, on such a project, which is you know, really cool. Um, this is a forest through the eyes of an autonomous drone using LIDAR and cameras. So this is the same way that a self-driving car sees the world. Um, the actual word autonomy means simply that the drone doesn't need a human to fly it, only to top up its battery every five or six hours. 
And this is actually um, work with um, um, UPenn, so University of Pennsylvania's GRASP Robotics Lab. And um, they've actually just, one of their researchers, a guy that I work with, Stephen Chen, has um, spun off a company called TreeSwift. And they're literally selling this, um, this research now. Obviously, the timber industry, which is, you know, trillions of dollars, um, is very interested in it for monitoring, but also for disaster response, for wildfire management, for example, because these drones are able to be, you know, put into an area um, and it maps in high red um, entire forests um, in, you know, in, in extremely accurate uh, resolution in, in under an hour, for example, depending on obviously the size of the, of the forest. And it really is, you know, climate change really is this black and white. As we all know, melting ice means blacker surfaces, which absorb more sunlight. And as the ice melts, the permafrost thaws, that releases methane, 20 times worse than CO2. We know this, um, but we also now know that this process cannot be stopped. There was a recent Nature paper. I don't know if, um, if people have missed that or not. And that's no matter what we do. So we simply have to adapt. And something else that I'm working with the UN on is um, putting together this digital ecosystem because two thirds of the environmental sustainable development goals to so the SDG indicators cannot yet be, be measured due to lack of data because we haven't yet harnessed AI with Earth observation with satellite data. Um, so putting this digital ecosystem into place for everybody to use is really critical to assess and predict risks, to increase transparency and accountability in, in management of resources. Um, but just obtaining that information or, you know, having a website that shows areas of deforestation literally nudges, you know, population level behavior um, and makes folks aware of the situation that's, um, that's you know, happening right now. Um, but luckily, we are a, technical, a technically advanced civilization. This is San Francisco, and it was taken by a unit called Heist in 2019. So um, OSK, or Orbital Sidekick, are a partner of ours, and they deployed Heist in, back in 2018. And it uses our embedded GPUs that are about the size of a credit card to enable something called hyperspectral imaging. Um, so this is um, images on multiple spectral um, frequencies. And here's Heist um, when it was um, living just outside the, uh, the International Space Station on one of its external platforms for over a year. Um, Sitting here, you can actually just see the, un the unit far right under the white canopy. Um, their business model is literally monitoring for farmers, um, for defence, for shipping companies, following shipping lines, etc. Um, this is the latest version of the embedded GPU. That's the development kit that you can get for testing and prototyping on, on the left. And that's the actual production module, which, you know, is um, depending on your screen size, um, you know, it's 70 by 45 or almost that size. Um, even software is getting easier and easier. You know, with the hardware is one thing, but it, but it means nothing without the software. But a key, a key component of um, NVIDIA's entire ecosystem is um, something that we call NGC or the NVIDIA GPU catalog. And it's essentially a hub of free, completely, utterly free, optimized software um, in easy to find and easy to use collections um, there's over a hundred different um, pre-trained models, um, so it's it's basically designed for immediate software engineering, immediate deployment, and every single one of them is validated for performance, um, quality, and security. But the really interesting thing is um, creating an accurate neural network um, or an accurate AI system requires a massive amount of fine tuning um, or training. Um, it's a very very complex. A process, but we've done most of the hard work for you because you can just pull down a pre-trained network to do some fairly, you know, standard um, AI value add, you know, to create those small value adds. Um, but on the other side, um, the beauty of AI, of these neural networks, is that you can use them to actually train themselves. So we're now capable of having an AI system make itself the most optimal neural network that it is, if that makes sense, we're going inter, inter. 
Um, this is actually two-year-old work, you know, the, um, the the paper reference there on the slide um, from Facebook and Stanford. And there's, there's been a ton more happening in, um, in the neural architecture search space. Um, but um, from my point of view, um, you know, the, the most exciting part of my day job um, is what we do in the world of virtual reality or extended reality. So NVIDIA spent decades working on what we call the metaverse or virtual worlds. Um, obviously, you know, starting from scenes for games, scenes for training, virtual cars to drive safely through virtual cities with virtual people, etc. But how do you put physical accuracy into a virtual world? Um, is that video working? Can you see it? So basically, what you do is you simply pick an object in a scene and you apply physics to it. It's literally as simple as that, because we already have had um, something called physics, which is a physics engine for over 20 years, um, and it's in constant development. It's also an integral part of what we call now Omniverse, which coupled with all the goodness from the gaming world, world and the movie world, so Disney um, has Pixar, and Pixar has a universal scene description, um, and this allows it to be easily implemented, and we can literally create anything in that virtual world. Um, you know, that's just a still image, for example. But virtual robots, again, this is just a, a still image. Um, but virtual robots, including cars, can be fully developed and fully tested before they go into the physical world. And we have research papers that have been published, um, you know, credited papers that actually prove that combining its simulation with reality improves the overall results because of course we can come up with all kinds of different corner cases and you know literally pluck out of thin air or you know the crazy corner cases that we may never think of. Um, as you can see here, we've got hundreds of virtual robots that are being trained in a virtual world with something called reinforcement learning, which is a type of extreme trial and error learning. To grasp a drawer and open it seems fairly trivial, but note the accuracy of the blocks moving inside the drawer. This is a fully physically correct and accurate simulation um, environment. Um, and the platform Isaac is free to everyone um, to use. Isaac Sim, um, Isaac Jim is the reinforcement side. The whole thing runs on GPU and it's training two separate neural networks to perform locomotion and obstacle um, avoidance. And once the training is complete, you simply take the code or take the weights um, and, and put it into a real robot. Um, so that real robot will then perform accurately and safely. And this is um, another virtual robot, the, the flat yellow thing, um, which is actually called an STR. Um, and it's been trained completely in the Isaac platform. And it's, can, and it's fully used now by BMW in their German um, production facilities. So what they do is um, using these test facilities, they can um, fully get you know get compliance all iso standards achieved before they actually put the real object into their real production facility the ai compute um on board is our embedded gpus our uh, jets and xavier and um you know we can digitally twin anything literally that you can think of so um i'll um i'll close up now by saying that you and i are we're currently trapped on Earth by gravity, um, but stood on the moon, which others will be doing again very soon in just a, just a couple of years, um, two or three, maybe 2023, 20, 24. Um, this would be your view. So in the, for, in the foreground here, you can see the far side of the moon. This is actually the, the high rise um, shot from quite a few years ago, actually now. Um, and it's clearly showing the continent of Africa where civilization began. So closing thought would be that with humans plus AI, absolutely anything is possible. And um, we, we should really remember that. I've only had time to give you just a few highlights here. So if you do want a deeper dive in the hows and the whys, um, we've got a full training curriculum um, that spans from fundamentals to industry specific applications, teaching you literally hands on how to build and uh, deploy neural networks in a variety of different tasks using our software. 
and actually using our GPUs in the cloud. And um, in most cases, we actually pay for the for the GPU on your behalf. So um, that's it. Thanks for listening and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Alison. Uh, I'm, I'm sure people have really enjoyed your talk and uh, they have been mesmerized by looking at, uh, you know, those pictures of NVIDIA and the GPUs and how you have been using it across industries, so definitely using AI to its fullest, you know, but also striving to make it more greener and sustainable working with the UN and looking at the projects that you have been involved in. I think people are going to love your bios and uh, would want to connect to you offline. Uh, and yes, uh, AI is a huge field, I think, cannot be summarized in one word, but uh, yes, AI plus human is the key, I think, uh, and including the ethics into it. Uh, the human in the loop is the key, I think, uh, to grow AI in the right sense, in the right direction uh, with sustainability, I think. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, and over to you, My Richard. Uh, yeah. Alison, thank you so much. And Jaisal, thank you there for summarizing. Um, that was wonderful. Three sort of connected and uh, mind-expanding talks tonight. Uh, Jaisal, have you noticed any questions that have been coming yes. in while we have you on yes. the screen? Yes. yes, yes. So I'll just read out some of the questions. So one of the open questions that came in from Danny is, if gaming companies are creating virtual worlds, and with processing power growing so fast, how long will it be until there is a computer that can recreate a simulation of the Earth as it is? Um, so I'm actually working with with folks um, right now. Um, you know, the um, that cloud simulation that uh, that I showed you is is just it's what we call a tile. Um, so the the great thing is, you know, like I said, you can't use um, you can't compute everything on the globe, just like, you know, we can't see every bit of weather, we can't see the atmosphere, you know, that kind of thing. But what you can do is you can um, use something called um, harmonic spherical dwarfs, um, which basically you can digitally twin a certain area of it or a tile of, um, you know, the, the, the sphere of, of the globe. And you can compute that tile to a, um, extremely accurate um you know to extremely accurate precision and um this is the, the the whole basis of parallel computing where you um essentially um use uh something called recursion you know you take a huge problem and you break it down into small parts and you in parallel solve those smaller parts until you have the you know the the whole solution and and it's that kind of predictive capability that ai has got now so it's it's literally started to happen in the past year um if you um if you've if you use met office uh, you know almost daily it might be a thing with age that you start you know watching the weather more closely as you get older but um, almost daily i'll look at the met office um web api and it's getting better and better you know i it, i don't have i don't live in an area that's exactly you know their nearest sort of spot but it's fairly on par but what we're able to do now is get um I think it's, it updates every 15 to 20 minutes and it's pretty accurate. You know, it can give you wind speeds. It can give you, you know, the overall weather. Um, it can't give you um, particularly accurate, you know, is it going to take the roof off your house kind of weather right now? But we've, we've already proven this summer with Frontier Development Lab that you can, you can make those kind of predictions. So um, we've already got that capability, um, Danny. We just, um, we haven't yet perfected it but it's it's evolving and um we're going to get um i don't know whether you need a, a virtual world but it's that concept called digitally twinning you know take bmw for example where they digitally twin their entire production facility so they can do the testing um you know safely and conveniently before they actually spend all the money and it's the same with robotics you know it's a lot easier to let your robot fall in a virtual world than it is you know to spend a million pounds on darpa um, competitions and take a robot that falls over because it can't open the door yet, you know, that kind of thing. We're, we're learning as we go, <laughs> literally. Thanks, thanks, Alison. Uh, there's another question from Alex. Uh, why can't we take capabilities of NPCs in the gaming world and put them into robots in the real world? 
it's not about hardware limitations it's about it's about the total absence of any understanding in these systems uh, what would you like to say about this alison sorry can you just say it? i lost you a little bit in the in the beginning the actual key question uh, yeah why can't we take the capabilities of npcs in the gaming world and put them into robots in the real world npcs yep maybe i should uh, explain my question yep yeah. so that's you talk aya very nice talk um and obviously you're not in the business of general ai of autonomous thinking entities but i'm wondering you've got these fantastic non player characters who are programmed with physics with appearance oh, okay. with all sorts of capabilities um and yet we still don't have robots that can wash the dishes you know why is that i don't believe it's a hardware limitation what's the limitation um so i don't want to um counter uh, danko but um we we don't have robots currently that can wash dishes because there is no um you know dollar value yet um however um robots are extremely good at manipulation now um you know they can um do they can solve a rubik's cube with a single hand with a single hand actuator um they can juggle um i work with um with a group in um technical university of darmstadt um a um a principal investigator professor jan peters and all his students and um they have a robot um a very high um speed uh, robot um that can actually juggle and it can juggle far faster than a human will ever be able to to juggle um and and it can um actually one hand or two hand um and it's actually you know the the complexity in in doing um one hand is is really really crazy there's a there's a ton of things but um i mentioned this earlier with the the commercialization aspect I'm working with that I can't name that are working on um doing um AI cooking so you know the those kind of um kitchen techniques you know we already have robotic um barmen or barmaids um you know that can that can pour cocktails and and that dexterity is simply because and that research is because we need and there is a huge market for elderly care and having robotic helpers you know that need to accurately be able to pour a cup of tea you know without spilling it all over an actual human that need to be able to move around um but um so far as the actual um uh the game side of it um there are so all of the major game houses have ai labs now and they're all putting um ai capability and what i mean by that is something called um it's it's an area of reinforcement learning called um inverse reinforcement learning and there's a ton of other techniques as well where they're putting capability into the gaming characters into the virtual world in the in the characters so that they can adjust their gameplay um because um I'm not much of a gamer myself I have to be honest I work for Nvidia but um you know hardly ever play the game however if it's if something's too hard you don't get anywhere you know you don't reach the other levels if something's too easy you you throw it away and you you buy another game so what they actually want is that dynamic capability for the ai characters to be a little easier when it's when the going gets tough and a little harder when the going gets easy and you can actually program that into a character in a game now and of course that makes millions for the actual video game um, engines you know for the software developers for that entire industry and um you know we've already seen um i forget the name of the actual movie now but interactive movies are going to be um you know the the next big thing where you can actually choose the plot yourself you know etc but we're just scratching the surface right now there's so much more that we can do thanks thanks alison uh danko there are a couple of questions for you and i think they are more to do with dishes people are really interested in that one <laughs> so i'll i'll just uh, uh, let you know so if we are teaching ai to wash up will it now think that it has to get into the washing up bowl <laughs> it's a funny one but yeah uh, people would want to know and, and do we need the ai 
also uh, there's a related question do we need the ai to work as human or in other words which one is powerful uh, i i wish i understood i heard this well could you could you repeat please just the first question yep if we are teaching ai to wash up will it now think that it has to get into the washing up bowl I'm not understanding this. Uh, it, it's more of a joke, thank you. <laughs> it's it's what? Yeah. A joke. People, yep. And uh, they want to know: Do we need the AI to work as human, or in other words, which one is powerful? They want to know which one is powerful. I mean, do we, do we need AI to work as human? I don't know. I mean, it depends on the market. What the market yeah. says, like if somebody builds uh, AI that works as human and nobody buys it, and everybody wants to buy AI with wheels, then we will not have AI to work as human. But it, it, you know, we'll need robots that gonna be uh, that have to be able to navigate stairs, at least. And how are they gonna do it? I don't know. It all depends. It's, it's definitely uh, I, I a moral question. Yeah, I mean, every, every application, you know, has um, a moral question, as um, as Rudy said um, initially. If you want to sell that product, um, you know, is there a market and can it do it safely? You know, for example, a, a robot helper for our el elderly parents. You know, whether we like it or not, there there are plenty of occasions, you know, which create that entire industry of of elderly care homes. You know where we don't have the time to to be, um, you know, there twenty four seven for our elderly parents or, or friends. So there is a huge market for these helper robots, especially in Japan, where they have you know a much higher volume of of older people, you know, retired people. Um, and there's a definite market, but of course it's got to be safe and and morally, you know, is it going to sell? Actually, you know, it's already been proven that it will, which is why a ton of research is now being done on it. And you know, so you have that sort of, um, you know, morally driven AI um, industry, you know, that's both research and commercial. And, and we must not forget that we are all going to get old, and we better solve these problems now, so we have comfortable days afterwards. <laughs> I'm counting on the people on these kind of calls. Absolutely. <laughs> Easy life. Do you know what? The one I want, Danko, is the exoskeleton so I can go climbing mountains when I'm in my 90s. That's what I really want. Alison, how are they coming along, the exoskeletons? Um, pretty cool, actually. There's, there's Japanese companies that, that have them up and running. They cost a fortune, but that's just you know, ah, supply be, and demand, right? They'll be free yeah. by the time I'm 90, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just hopefully going to go to space where, you know, you can fly around everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter. Forget <laughs> bones and muscle, you know, just go into That's space. But... Gravity is the problem. Yeah. We need to get rid of that. Yeah. Wonderful. Totally. Um, well, we've got two minutes. I Well, I prob we have, probably haven't got time for one last question, unfortunately, but um, we do like to finish on time. So I think Rudy, I haven't checked, but I think Rudy's probably dashed off. I'm just quickly scanning down here. Uh, so... No, I can't see him, so we'll say thank you in his absence for his talk. Uh, Danko, thank you so much for yours. Alison, thank you so much for yours. Um, I'm getting the praise for your talks. How is this possible? This is ridiculous. Um, you know, you just... <laughs> it's um, very easy just to put the stage on for people like this, I promise you. Um, and I'm very, very grateful. We hope we'll perhaps see you again for a future MKI if you come back and, and do another talk for us at some point. That would be amazing. Yeah, um, so, uh, so Richard... Pleasure. Richard, thank you also. I'm organizing an AI meetup here in Frankfurt, and I know it's not easy what you do. It's a lot of work. So we have to thank you as well. <laughs> Maybe a little. Um, so last things, obviously, remember, go ahead and, and book uh, January now um, before uh, Christmas uh, hangovers hit and those kind of things. Um, I mentioned the WhatsApp group as well. Um, this is it for us, so we won't see you now for a couple of months, but we'll keep the conversation going in that WhatsApp group. Um, just maybe just last use the last few seconds to thank our speakers again. And uh, and thanks everybody who's been on some or all of this journey in 2020. What a bizarre year, but someone said to me, I can't wait till 2020 ends. And it's like, 2020 is not the problem. 
the problem is all the debt that we've been accumulating <laughs> by avoiding all the problems. <laughs> and now, bang, it's caught up with us in 2020. So let's see what next year brings. Let's stay hopeful, stay positive, stay happy. And uh, wonderful to see friendly faces, new faces. I hope to see you all again. Thank you.